Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for another opportunity to, to just come together and feast upon your word, to study it, to look at it, to think about it, to meditate on it. I thank you for all those that have that you've brought here to participate with us in this study. I ask your blessings of grace and peace upon every one of them. I ask that you would filter out all the foolishness, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve again at blessedhopeforever.com. We're continue, going to continue on in our study that we just began in the, the epistle to the Philippians verse by verse, uh, hopefully verse by verse. Uh, we're also going into May here, and which is uh, an interesting month in the year of 2021, prophetically, at least as far as Torah calendar is concerned. So we're going to find out if we're going to be here past May 17th. And uh, we've also got another interesting timeline for July. So we're going into a a very interesting season and that particularly in light of everything that we see going on in the world and going on around us but the best thing that I, I feel like that we can do is, is stay in the word and that's I know how, that, how hard that that can be sometimes with our busy lives and with all the uh, uh, distractions but if we make time for it, then I believe God honors that, and uh, and we come out ahead. We've just started this study in the the first video, part one, when we kick this this whole study off. <clears throat> I spent some time talking about verse six as being a very powerful verse concerning our eternal security, and, and that is absolutely true. I find it amazing how the number of Christians that can argue that point whenever you have a verse such as Philippians 1.6. We can be confident of this very thing, confident, the opposite of that being doubting, that, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And it's only fitting that Paul says that for me to think this way of, of, about you all, because he, I have you in my heart. And, you know, I read those words and I, and, and I think how that we have one another in our hearts. You know, uh, I can tell from the messages that I read that, that you folks leave me that you, you have me in your heart and I, I have you in my heart as well. And I think it's it's worthy of our time to pause and ask the question, you know, how did that come about? How did, how did we get to the point to where we had one another in our heart? And I think there's a stark difference between modern Christianity's view of redemption and, and that we have to do something to be redeemed and the biblical truth of the matter, and that is that we're redeemed only because Christ died in our place. And I think that the, the latter, the, the, the truth of, the, of that is uh, really works in, in a tremendous way in, in us having one another in our hearts. Uh, as I go through and I read this text, Inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are all partakers of my grace. And yet the tendency is to think that we as believers in Christ, you know, some of us have received more grace from God than others. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the, in the affections of Jesus Christ. Christ longs for us. If you think you long for Christ, uh, I got news for you. He longs for you more. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all, discern in, uh, in all judgment. So uh, love is not just some, you know, sort of 
kind of as the world understands it, you know, it's this, uh, it's this uh, mushy sort of, you know, romantic sort of, you know, thing that, you know, will we'll just give someone anything that they want because just simply because they want it doesn't matter if it's good for them or not. And we know we love one another because he first loved us. But it is the Holy Spirit's, and, and I want you to keep in mind, I've, I've tried to point this out all along through every study. It is, we're not looking at the words of Paul. We're not looking at the logic of Paul. We're not looking at the reasoning of Paul. We're looking at the uh, God, the Holy Spirit, the author writing through Paul, where Paul merely held the pen. Now, now, did Paul have the feelings that we see described? Well, obviously he did. But there was the fellowship that Paul had with the Lord uh, was in harmony with God's Word. His will and his desire and his purpose for our lives is no different than what Paul, you know, Paul's will, Paul's will for our lives, his desire, his, his purpose, his desired purpose for our lives is no different than the Holy Spirit's. That your love may abound yet more and more. So it's, it's an increase. There's an increase in knowledge and in all judgment. So it's, it's, it's associated with, it's tied together with, it's connected to, it can't be separated from knowledge. Uh, I don't have any trouble saying that, that I see in that, in that text there that love can be, it's possible for love to be not a genuine love as scripture is describing it, but it, it can be an artificial, it can be a pseudo uh, love, sort of love that, that has no relationship to knowledge. Can we be stupid, dumb, ignorant, and love one another? That's the question. Well, I... Uh, of course we can, but, but our love, our true, genuine love for one, one another, according to the text, is only associated with, related to, connected to, a true knowledge of Christ. And, and in all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent. Now hold on a minute. Approve? We have to that we're going to test, put to the test, we're going to approve things that are excellent, and what things are these, is, is, what things is the Holy Spirit talking about? That you may be sincere and without offense till the day of, of Jesus Christ. Well, I don't want to bite off more than I can chew here, but w without talking about the, the offense till the day of Christ, Let's let's just stop for a moment and think about the, uh, our approving things that are excellent. Okay. Approving, I have to approve things that are excellent. Now it seems to me like that if we were under law, not grace, and and that was what God had, how God had called us to walk, we're to walk under law, not grace, and we're looking at the Bible that basically is a is a a, a long list of instructions, a book of instructions on how to live the Christian life. And so we're just, just kind of to put, to put our best foot forward and, and hope that, we, you know, hope, hope for the best. Just hope that we do the best. You know, maybe we will succeed, maybe we won't. My question would be, how, how is it, where does the approving things that are excellent fit into that? Why should I be approving or testing, putting to the test things that have to do with law? We know God's law is perfect. It's not, it's not that there's anything wrong with the law, but there may be something wrong with me. That you may be sincere and without offense. And I don't know how many times you people have heard me say God has nothing against us. And yet here we are now looking at, at a verse that talks about us being sincere and without offense until the day that Christ returns. Uh, how is it that we become 
an offense, that our lives become an offense, that our lives become un, unsin, unsincere, uh, not sincere. We're not sincere. You know, we're not, we're not sincere. We're not genuine. We're, our lives, our, our walk is an offense to God. Is that possible? Is that what the text is saying? That you may be sincere without offense till the day of Jesus Christ. It is not our redemption that's in question here. We're looking at the life of the believer described by Paul through the Holy Spirit and believers in, in, in their relationship with one another, okay, which is centered upon that solid foundation of their relationship with Christ. Being filled with the fruit, fruits, I believe your, your text will say fruits of righteousness. It's literally a fruit singular. The singular fruit of righteousness, which is by Jesus Christ. Unto the glory and praise of God. It's not your work. It's not your fruit. It's not your righteousness, okay? It's not your affection, even your affection for, for me. And my affection for you is to be the affection. It's, it, we, long, we greatly long after one another in the bowels of Jesus Christ, the affections of Jesus Christ. Everything is, everything is run through Christ. Everything is filtered through Christ. It is not I, but Christ. It is the, we're looking at the difference here just as we we will see or should have seen all all the way through into philippians and as we see as we go out of philippians and we continue on out of philippians the, there's a difference between being and doing uh i should s switch that around is the difference there's a difference between doing and being uh, anyone can do anyone can do this or don't do this or you know live under the law uh, uh, live their lives uh, according to the flesh uh, walk according to the flesh uh, obey a list of, of instructions somehow succeed at least in their own minds of, of accomplishing something that scripture says to do or or to not do it's possible entirely possible to do that it is the, the, the problem is, is that this is the flesh that's operating. It's not the spirit. The problem is that this is a law-based, law-oriented, legalistic-oriented uh, walk and conduct and relationship with God. It has nothing to do with Christ and His finished work. Our love for one another is the result of God's grace toward us. Show me a believer who doesn't understand God's grace, and I'll show you a believer who doesn't understand our really understand our love for one another. We've all become partakers of this same grace. You, you haven't received anything that I haven't received, and vice versa. And yet, modern Christianity wants to drill it into us repeatedly, time and time again, that there are some of us who have received more grace from God than others. I want, you to, I want you to take serious note of the fact. Write it in your Bible here. Note that the Holy Spirit is addressing every single one of you, every single saint, without exception. He's being all-inclusive. He's not choosing, like, you know, back in school, you know, where they'd choose sides to play dodgeball, you know. and uh, So, you know, you'd pick the best players. We don't have our own, each of us, we don't have our own custom revelation tailored especially for us. What we're reading here is applied to, it is, it is addressing every single, absolutely every single saint in Christ Jesus from the least to the greatest. There's none lacking. There's none coming behind in God's grace. We don't have our own custom revelation. We're to, we're to read what God says, take it at face value, believe what God has said, 
and, and believe him when he says that the least of us is the greatest among us. I want you folks, listen to me. I want you to, to look at your life in Christ today. And I, I don't think there's any more important time to do it. I want you to look at your life in Christ. Look at it as a whole. Okay? Today. Don't look at it in fragments, in pieces, in, you know, broken shards. Okay? Pieces. Well, I was like this at one time, and this I was like this at one time, and I succeeded in doing this at one time, and I failed miserably in doing this at another time. And you're looking at, you're judging outwardly, and you're, you're basically judging yourself as to, as to whether or not, you know, somehow you, and it ultimately, it always leads to this. It's, 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 an, it's a self-evaluation based upon your own performance, on your own, your own human performance. How, how well did you, did you do, you know, to, to somehow satisfy a never-ending craving, never-ending, you know, a God that never ends, never, never stops craving, you know, that we do righteousness and we do things that are pleasing and well-pleasing in His sight. And then He's kind of all just left it up to us to, you know, He's not really, you know, working in us both the will and do of His good pleasure. He's not really going to, you know, complete the work to which He began in us. He doesn't really work all things according to the counsel of his own will. No, no, he, he, he just, he's, he's told you what he wants you to do. He's left you to your own devices. And, and, he's, and he's praying that you'll somehow do your best. And he's, he's there to step in and help you whenever you need help. In your time of need, he's, he's always going to be there. But he's going to help you. He's going to help you. Because it is, it's all about you. You've got to succeed. You've got to become victorious. You've got to achieve. You've got to overcome. You, 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 you. It's all about you. And dearly beloved, I want you to look at the text here and I want you to, I pray, I pray that you see that this is not about you. Okay? It's not about you. where we grade our progress or our performance in respect to seeming success and failure, it, I have to ask, in what light are we to walk, live, conduct ourselves? How are we to do that? How are we to, to, to now live? Or maybe I should, I, I should say, I ask you, why do we love and pray for one another? Why do we do that? Why do I pray for you? Why do I love you? And vice versa. Why do we do that? Why? Is it so that God will do something? Or is it because He is doing something? Because He has done something, He is doing something, and He will do something, and that spurs us, that increases our love. Our love for one another abounds more and more. Why? Because we're looking at what He's done, not what our focus is on Christ and His finished work, not on ourselves and our own so-called successes and failures. And we can see from the text that it is Christ's desire for us that we abound more and more in knowledge and in all discernment. Knowledge and discernment of what? Of what? Of just more instructions, you know, uh, more do's, more don'ts, more instructions, more law. Is that what we're growing in? We're growing in knowledge and in an all discernment of the law. What is this pure and this blameless walk that the text speaks about where that we can stand before God, holy, unblameable, unreprovable in His sight, without spot, without blemish. We know He'll present us that way. And yet... In our experience, in our walk, in our conduct, our day-to-day -day conduct and our day-to-day -day life, what is this pure and blameless walk that the text speaks about? What is it? 
How do I walk blamelessly before God? How do I walk a pure and blameless conduct myself pure and blamelessly before God? Because I have an old man. I have a sinful old nature that it's, it's in conflict with, with my new man. I'm going to suggest to you folks that the way that we walk, that we conduct ourselves and we walk in a pure and blameless way, okay, in which we're being filled with the singular fruit of the Spirit along the way, the way that we do that is, is, is we reckon ourselves dead to sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The first command given us in the book of Romans, Romans 6.11, our focus is not on sin, it's not on self, it's not on the flesh, it's not on us at all. Okay? For our focus to be on Christ and not ourself, because we have no righteousness in and of our, our, our own selves, That this, this is that pure and that blameless walk that the text is speaking about, that Paul is, is introducing us to here. The text says, being filled, that's a present tense, filled with the singular fruit of righteousness. The singular fruit, not fruits of righteousness. There's only one true source, and that's Christ. That's verse 111. Three ones. You've got three ones there. You know, you could look at that as a trinity. People that are really love the numbers thing. Singular fruit of righteousness. Verse 111, 111. Through Christ, resulting in God, being given glory and praise. Okay? This is how we're to walk. It's a curious question to ask. How do Christians who live under law, who just simply look at the Bible as a book of instructions on how to live the Christian life and try to do the best they can, and, and they hang their head low when they, when they fail, and they hold their head high when they succeed, tell me, how is it that this is something that results in God being given glory and praise? This is how we are to walk, folks. This is how we're to conduct our lives. And this I pray, says Paul. Okay? So it's God's prayer for us. God's very own prayer. His own desire, His own will, His own prayer for us. The text is expressing God's will for us in Christ. That you may approve things. That is, put to the test. That's, a, that's, that's putting to the test to, re, to reveal what is something to be good or genuine. If you had something that you knew was good, that you knew was, was true, that you knew was genuine, and you, and you put it to the test to prove to others that this was, this was good. That's what the word means. That you may approve things. That is, put to the test. Reveal what is good. Prove them to be correct. Now, how could that be speaking a law? That, that's, that would be my question to you. How could that possibly be referring to law or the flesh? You know, these instructions are to be put to the test. These laws of God are be to, to be put to the test. Folks, the things that are excellent are His works. Not ours, but His. So don't, don't put a question mark where God puts a period. He settled this. Okay? He's told us this is how we're to walk. This is who we are. This is the result of His work. You're looking here in, in, in Paul's description of the believers and their relationship to God and to one another. This is the result of His work. Not our own. Believing God that He's faithful. That He can be trusted where we rest in His finished work. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you also were put to death in regard to the law through the body of Christ so that you might belong to another, to Him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. Romans chapter 7, 4. Same author. Romans 7, 4. 
I love these words. Even as it is me, even as it's fitting, it's only right, it's only correct that for me to think this of you all, all, all of you, that's all inclusive, every believer. Paul isn't evaluating anyone by their, by their, their performance here. Because I have you in my heart inasmuch as both in my bonds. And in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. Those are heavy, heavy words, folks. You are all partakers of my grace. That was Paul's heart for the believers at Philippi. That was his joy. He includes them, their faith, in what he believed was his defense and confirmation of the gospel. So the question is, how are we going to live given this, these facts, this truth? How are we going to live? Uh, I, uh, I would love to be able, and I've never been able to do a very good job of this, but I would love to be able to just go through the text and play, you know, as play devil's advocate somewhat, you know, and read it how I believe that most common believers, you know, today uh, who haven't been taught a whole lot about grace, how they would read this. I thank God, my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making a request for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Your fellowship in the gospel. Oh, we see we got to get, we got to, we got to have fellowship in the gospel. We got to be, get busy evangelizing. We got to get bu busy getting people to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And this is why I thank my God upon every re remembrance of you. And being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you of course, that only that only pertains to those of you who, who qualify, who are, you know, there's a qualitative fact factor to be considered here. I mean, this this can't possibly be talking about every single Christian. Surely, it's not doing that. That he he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. There's some of you out there. He hasn't be, he hasn't he hasn't begun a, a really he hasn't yet really begun a good work in you. But once he does, he'll complete it. But I, there's a question as to whether he's begun that good work in you or not. Just as it, it is right for me to think this of you all because I have you in my heart. God, look, folks, you know, walk into any church in America or any, any church anywhere. And you're going to see believers that, that, that are actively engaged in activities which would uh, confirm that to some extent they love one another. I mean, you're not going to see a lot of fights in churches, okay? You won't see very many fist fights going on. For the most part, they're, they're going to love one another. What I'd like to get you, you folks to think about here though is just how we often misuse these terms you know uh, to uh, actually not love one another the way that God intended that we love one another is something that we ought to all think about you know do I when I by loving you what am I talking about when I talk about loving you Oh, I love this brother so much that I'm gonna put wrap him up into I'm gonna put I'm gonna put so many heavy chains on him. He's he's gonna have to 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 succeed. 
I'm going to bound him so tightly up in law keeping as a rule of life that God's going to have to be happy with him because I love him so much. Well, folks, I'm running out of time. I just wanted to say that, and it's, believe it or not, as, as simple as this is, I find it very difficult to express my feelings about the text. The tendency is to prejudice the text right from the start. We open our Bible, we look at any passage of Scripture, and right away, before we even realize that we're even doing it, or thinking about it, what we're doing is we're filtering everything that we read through ourselves. Ourselves. Our own failings, shortcomings, successes, and shortcomings. Well, I need to work a little harder on this part of my life. And I pretty much got this, this part of my life under control. So now I've, I've got to work on this part. There's nothing fluid or, uh, well, there's nothing constant. You know, in, in this, it's a, the Christian life is a bumpy road, man. It's, it's a road of ups and downs, man. You, you know, you're trusting one day, you're doubting the next. I'm not saying that there's not a place and a purpose for doubts in the believer's life. I believe God works through that. And I believe he actually constructs and ordains all of that. But I would suggest to you that there is a faith rest involved in the, in the Christian walk, where that we are trusting in him, not ourselves, where that everything is filtered through that. And our focus is on Christ, not self. And I think that the, the whole entire epistle to the Philippians is a masterpiece of, of the Holy Spirit in, in drawing our attention to the grace that we have in Jesus Christ. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, rest in Him. And thanks for watching.